Good afternoon, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. There has not been much difference uh, with regards to the management of acute exacerbation since the last revision in 2002. So basically what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to highlight some of the key recommendations by the uh, work group in the latest uh, CPG guidelines for the management of asthma exacerbation. So what do we mean when we refer to this uh, term called excess, acute exacerbation of asthma? It's basically an episodes of progressively worsening the usual symptoms of uh, asthma, shortness of breath, cough, wheezing, chest tightness, or a combination of these symptoms, and it's usually characterized by a decrease in the peak flow or decrease in the in the FEV1. So there's some objective measures that uh, uh, accompanies these uh, changes in the symptoms. And it's important for us as uh, physicians caring for patients with asthma to actually educate patients so that they're able to recognize symptoms of uh, acute exacerbation of asthma so they know when to intervene and how to intervene. The other important thing about acute exacerbation of asthma is that the speed of progression is usually variable and it can be as short as you know a couple of minutes to hours or days. And as uh, Professor Daniel Goh has mentioned, the perception of asthma severity is often poor, you know, and that uh, refers to the perception of asthma by patients, relatives, healthcare workers, you know, they are often uh, poor and that usually leads to this underestimation of the severity of an, an uh, acute attack and it is important therefore for us all to actually educate the patient and family so that they are familiar with the asthma action plan and they are able to recognize uh, symptoms of acute exacerbation and act early according to the prescribed uh, asthma action plan. So the basic principle is that mild exacerbations can be treated at home while severe exacerbations would require closer supervision and should be treated in an acute care facility. So basically our role is to differentiate between mild exacerbations you know, from those severe exacerbations that requires a higher level of care. So what are mild exacerbations? Basically when patients have report an increased need for short-acting beta-2 agonist as a reliever when they have nocturnal uh, awakening due to nocturnal symptoms or if the patient is on a peak flow monitoring then the peak flow reduction is less than 20%. All these would be categorized as mild exacerbations and then these can be treated at home. Whereas severe exacerbations may be potentially life-threatening and those uh, need to be referred for a, for a higher level of care. So in the clinic, the Assessment of severity, so it's, it's important to actually differentiate because then recommended treatment would depend on the severity. So if you have the, the respiratory arrest, the impending respiratory arrest, that's fairly uh, easy to recognize. The patients are drowsy and confused. They've got bradycardia. They've got absent and wheeze, almost a silent chest. Uh, that would be respiratory, impending respiratory arrest and that you know, you need to resuscitate the patient. Patients who have got severe uh, asthma uh, exacerbation, they would be able to only speak in words. They are breathless even at rest. They hunch forward, you know, they've got a tachypnea, they've got a, a tachycardia. And if you measure their, their peak flow, they are usually less than 60% of uh, predicted. Whereas patients with mal, uh, who have got mal, asthma exacerbation, they are able to talk in sentences, they may be agitated, their respiratory rate is increased, they, they don't have, uh, usually do not have a use of uh, accessory muscle or suprasternal uh, retraction. And their lung function is generally uh, good, the peak flow greater than 80%. Now the other important uh, thing that uh, you should sort of uh, recognize is that sort of pick up patients with uh, risk factors for death from asthma. So these are patients who have got prior intubation and mechanical ventilation, patients who have been hospitalized before or they've got uh, accident and emergency attendances for asthma exacerbation in the past one year. Or they have, they're currently needing to use systemic corticosteroids or they've recently just had a cost of uh, systemic corticosteroids and they're in the withdrawal phase or they are not currently using, they've got persistent asthma and they're not currently using their, uh, their controller medication in the form of inhaled corticosteroids. And if they've got excessive use of the SABA, the taken to be more than one canister per month of inhaled SABA, or patients have got psychiatric disease or psychosocial uh, problems, and patients who have got 
non-compliance with asthma medication. So these are all the patients who have got risk factors for death from asthma. And when you see a patient with any of these features, you want to pay closer attention and they need to be so supervised uh, more closely that they actually understand uh, the disease and their, their action plans. So the, the mainstay of treatment, uh, one of the, the, the medications that we would give in acute exacerbation is this uh, short-acting beta-2 agonist and if you've heard that it is used as a reliever. So then the other important uh, components in the acute care apart from the rapid-acting beta-2 agonist is the use of uh, ipratropium, the anticholinergic ipratropium. You need to institute systemic corticosteroids and if you've got oxygen, then you will uh, want to administer oxygen. So the details of the acute asthma exacerbation in the clinic the, for the initial treatment, uh, you can either use you can either use nebulizer, this uh, rap rapid acting beta two agonist, for instance, albutamol five to ten milligrams every twenty minutes for one hour, or alternatively, you can actually use the use of an inhaler like twenty puffs of salbutamol. Uh, administered via uh, a spacer and the data actually shows that the use of an inhaler plus a spacer is equally as effective as a nebulizer. Okay, so if you've got a situation where, you know, there's uh, say pandemic, uh, bird flu, you know, or, you know, in the era of SARS, that the use of an inhaler uh, with a spacer would be the preferred mode of administration uh, for the beta-2 agonist. Now, uh, then it is also recommended that uh, you add ipratropium, 0.5 milligrams, to an aerosolized uh, solution of beta-2 agonist. Because there is an, in the acute asthma exacerbation, there is an additive effect. If you use the short-acting beta-2 agonist plus the ipratropium, then you actually get a greater uh, improvement. And there's also data that uh, shows that you can actually reduce hospitalization rates. Then there is also a, a role for systemic corticosteroids. For instance, a short burst of prednisolone, 40 milligrams every day, stat, and repeated for seven to 10 days for all patients. And when you give a short burst of corticosteroids, you don't need to tail this medication down, you know? So you can just give it for seven to 10 days and just stop. Uh, that would actually make the treatment of acute exacerbation easier. Oral steroids are also uh, found to be as rapid and as effective as injections. So if the patient can take orally, you don't really need to give uh, uh, injection steroids like IV hydrocortisone. And of course, if you've got oxygen in your practice, then you should administer that to correct the hypoxemia. So as I've mentioned, short bursts of oral corticosteroids is fairly important in patients uh, in adult uh, asthma exacerbation, you need to give a short burst of oral corticosteroids and the reason for that is there's evidence to show that it prevents progression of asthma exacerbation, it reduces the need for A&E attendances and hospitalization, it prevents early relapse after the acute treatment, but the important thing that you need to bear in mind is that it takes four to six hours to work, okay? So during the initial period after treatment, you need, the patient needs to be monitored and assessed closely. Now, so acute, this is the algorithm that is found in the, the clinical practice guidelines for acute treatment of adult acute asthma in the clinic. And you can see, you know, that you need to assess the response. So after, say, about uh, an hour, if you have good, good response, then, then these patients can be discharged home. So what do we mean by a good response? So physical examination is normal. Their peak flow is uh, greater than 70% predicted. There's the typo error here. There shouldn't be no distress, meaning no respiratory distress. Okay, oxygen uh, saturation greater than 90%. So these patients can be discharged home. Uh, they need to be uh, to be told that they need to continue their treatment with inhaled beta-2 agonists for acute symptoms. You need to consider a short burst of uh, oral corticosteroids in most cases, and you need to reinforce uh, the asthma uh, action plan and to give a patient a close follow-up, right? On the other hand, if you've got a poor response within one hour, then, uh, and you've got a history where this patient has got high-risk features, you know, for asthmatic death, which I mentioned earlier, you know, and then clinical examination is, shows, you know, that they are still having uh, symptoms, you know, and uh, a poor lung function, then these are the patients that may require an admission to intensive care. If they've got an incomplete response within the first one and, or two hours, and if they've got a history of high-risk patient, 
physical examinations may be uh, abnormal, then these are the patients that need to be admitted to the hospital for further uh, observation and further uh, management. That's my last slide. So with that, I thank you for your attention.